myth. It is the worst kind of blindness. It's the physical ability to see without the spiritual ability to really see what you've seen. So it's being able to see with your eyes, but not being able to see past the physical to anything spiritual. It's a spiritual blindness. It's a it's the, the, the capacity of looking at the wonders all around the world that are designed to move you, that are designed to produce amazement in you, and not be moved by any of them. God has made us and made the world where we are supposed to be able to see the world with our physical eyes, but to then see past that to the spiritual reality that brings wonder and amazement of God in those physical things. But there is a blindness that comes upon humanity because of sin where we don't spiritually see. People may be able to physically see beauty and recognize that it's even beautiful, but then not have the spiritual sight to be able to see the wonder and the grandeur and the beauty and the glory of God through that. One of the things that um, is debated all the time is if we are simply a byproduct of naturalism, if we are simply a byproduct of um, evolution, then how do we account for beauty? How do we account for actually saying anything is beautiful? Where does a standard of beauty come from that we would ever call anything beautiful? But yet, the lost world, does they, they do look at things and say, wow, that is beautiful, that is glorious, that is, that is majestic. But they don't have the spiritual eyes to, to then look at that beauty and say, then there must be a beautiful creator that has made that, that I'm supposed to be in awe of. But yet, that is the, the state that the lost world is in. It's simply a yawning at the face of glory. Yawning at the face of glory. And unfe un unfortunately, most people suffer from this kind of blindness. And, and I want to say that even Christians, even though we are not spiritual blind, sometimes um, we allow our vision to become so hazy that we're not seeing properly. I want to talk about this term for a minute. Uh, there is a term that I, I want to use, and it's a made-up term. It's not a, probably a real term. It's the term glory scope. All right? God has designed the world to be a glory scope. What I mean by that is, just like a telescope points you at the stars and then magnifies the stars so you can see their glory, the earth is a glory scope where we are to be to focus our eyes on God and what magnifies His glory and, and that stuff's supposed to produce a wonder in us. So just like you would take a telescope and you would look at something that seems so small and you would see it for what it really is, the earth is a glory scope. When we look at the earth, when we look at creation and the beauty and the wonder that He has made, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to look through that like someone looks through a telescope. We're supposed to look through the glory of the earth and see God for the, for the glory that he has. Does that make sense? That's what I mean when I use the term glory scope. We are looking at the earth and it's supposed to produce a wonder in us. Every single amazing, beautiful thing in this world was built with that intention. God made every beautiful thing in this world. He designed every glorious thing in this world with the intention of you looking through it to see His glory. It was Nothing has been created in isolation. Nothing just is. Everything exists for a grand purpose vertical purpose. So we need to understand that the physical world does not reflect God's glory by chance. He has specifically designed it that way. He has designed it so that we are supposed to look at it and see this careful design 
and the reflection of it to our glorious God. As the technician gets behind a telescope, they've got to grind the gears to get the focus just right so you can see with clarity and magnification the, the stars that you're looking at. So God fashions the world in such a way that brings his glory into view. Let's look at a few verses that just illustrate this. Turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm chapter 19. And as you're turning there, we, we've spoken a lot in here. What is the ultimate goal of God? The ultimate goal of God is to make much of himself. The ultimate goal of God is to glorify himself. Okay? <laughs> That is what God is doing. So if you say, why is anything happening in the world the way that it's happening in the world? The ultimate answer is for the glory of God. If God, if something could be done differently that would bring God greater glory, he would do it. So what that means is that this world that God has created and everything that is happening in it ultimately is the greatest story written that brings God the greatest glory. God is not going to finish the story one day and look back and say, Ooh, I could have got more glory if I, I would have got more glory and better glory if I would have done this instead of this. Or if I would have done that instead of that. No, whatever is happening on the earth is bringing God the greatest amount of glory. If not, then he'd do something different. We need to keep that in mind. Everything is happening in the world. To bring God glory. And the way that God made everything. And the way that God created everything. Has been done so. To speak about. His glory. Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare. The glory of God. The sky above. Proclaims his handiwork. Day to day. It pours out speech. And night to night. It reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Do you know why creation declares the glory of God? Because he has designed it that way. It has been specifically and purposefully made that way. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. And I just picked three here. I mean, I obviously could have done a lot more. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 3. The angels sing this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Creation has been made in such a way that God's glory is magnified as we look at it. Again, it is a glory scope. And as we look at it, we see the glory of God everywhere. And then turn to Romans chapter 1. We've used this multiple times already in this series. Romans chapter 1. Verse 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them. The them is the un ungodly, unrighteous people who suppress the truth. But what can be known about them Known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. How has he shown it to them? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. God has made this world in such a way 
that it shouts forth and reveals his glory. Yet most people look at it and don't ever see it. That is a spiritual all blindness. That we can't fully comprehend because God has opened our eyes. Some of us can think back. When we lived in a world with this much glory and beauty and greatness and wonder, and yet our eyes never saw through it to the greatness and glory and wonder of Jesus. That's why it's here and that's what it does. It's what it's supposed to do. Not only are we incredibly blind, human beings are incredibly forgetful. There is a spiritual forgetfulness that we have. We learn things, then those things quickly become a distant memory. <clears throat> Once they become a distant mem memory, they have very little effect on the way that we think about God or the way that we live. You think about when God does something miraculous or God reveals something glorious and human beings in the moment, in the moment, are wow. And then what happens? As time passes, that wowness wears off and people go back. They forget. The wonder is gone. People do wonderful things for us. We may learn about our family heritage. We forget friends. Events from the past fade from our memory. Because the concerns of the present so dominate our mind that we have very little mental energy left to remember what came before. You think about the way that we live from day to day. Most people are just trying to make it. But God has not designed human beings to just make it. But what happens is, is because we're just because we're just trying to make it, we can't even remember what God did for us yesterday. We can't even remember the beauty that we saw yesterday because today is so concerning to us and we're just trying to make it today that we forget. And God will give lost people a wonderful common grace blessing. And instead of seeing this blessing, and maybe in the moment they say stuff like, I just want to thank God for this. I just want to praise the Lord for this. But then how quickly that dissipates, becomes a fading memory, and the glory of God, and the praise of God, and the beauty of God, and the wonder of God doesn't stick. It's because we are a spiritual, forgetful people. All you have to do is read through the Old Testament to know this is true. God has given us the greatest example of spiritual forgetfulness in the people of Israel. How many times did God in the Old Testament do something amazing for Israel? They repented. They praised God. They thanked the Lord. And then a little time goes by and guess what they do? They forget. Then they begin to grumble and complain and gripe and say stupid things like we're better off in Egyptian slavery. Such a forgetful people. Over and over again, as God was judging Israel, you know what he kept saying? Look at what I did for you here. Look at what I did for you here. Look at what I did for you here. And yet you go worship false gods. Such a spiritual forgetfulness. And many of us live from day to day forgetting the identity-giving story that defines life and everything that life should be about. We forget. <laughs> that our gospel gives us our identity today. So many people live wandering, disjointed lives, or we work to be the authors of our own glory, trying to make our own personal narrative turn in the direction we want it to turn as we are seeking to build our own kingdom and get it as large as we can. I've been reminded as we've been working through just the first couple chapters up in Refuge of the story of Daniel, I'm reminded of this because this is how Nebuchadnezzar is. Nebuchadnezzar has been given 
the greatest king, earthly kingdom on the planet. Babylon is the most powerful nation on the planet. God has given him that. Daniel makes it very clear to Nebuchadnezzar. God did this for you. And yet, instead of Nebuchadnezzar seeing the glory of Yahweh and focusing on Yahweh, he replaces all God with all of himself. How great he is, how wonderful he is, and he wants to build this kingdom as large as he could possibly get it. When we do this, we are attempting what we cannot do, and we're trying to get what we'll never get. Because of our forgetfulness, God has designed the world to be a mnemonic device. A mnemonic device is something that is to trigger remembrance in us. It's a, it's a remembering device to help us every day remember that we're not alone, that we're not the center of everything, that life is not primarily about us. Do you know that every single day God puts things in your life to help you remember? A father is one of these. God has made earthly fathers to be a reflection of the glory of the heavenly father. The shepherd reminds us of God's care for his own people. The snow reminds us of the Lord's purity and the forgiveness of sin. The thunderstorm reminds us of the power of and the judgment of God. The rising sun reminds us of God's daily faithfulness. You see what God has done? Because we are such a forgetful people, God has made, made these daily uh, mnemonic devices, these remembering devices in our lives. So when that sun comes up tomorrow, we should say, we have a great God. When the thunderstorm rolls in, we should think we have a powerful God. When the snow falls, and I know it doesn't happen much, but when it does here, we should say we have a pure God who makes us as white as snow. God puts those things in our lives to remind us and to help protect us from the amnesia that so quickly comes upon us. We are literally surrounded by gracious reminders of God's presence, power, and authority, and character every single day. But even with all that, even with all that, we tend to be forgetful. And you couple our forgetfulness, forget, forget, forget. mixing amnesia and forgetfulness together. <laughs> when you mix our spiritual blindness with our spiritual amnesia, when those two things go together, our capacity for all gets kidnapped by other things. And even Christians can be susceptible to this. It's not our spiritual condition anymore. We are still blind and forgetful in the flesh. And when we walk in the flesh, we can be as sinful as anybody else. We can be forgetful as anybody else. So what are some symptoms of our blind amnesia? I'm going to give you 12. They're in your sheet if you have them. I'm just going to say a few words about each one of them. What are some symptoms of our blind amnesia? Number one, self-centeredness. I'm going to repeat this again. When we replace, when we do not have God at the center of our all, we will replace him with ourselves. We do it all the time. Instead of focusing on being in awe of God, we replace God, all of God with all of ourselves, and we live for ourselves. And when we do that, we become obsessed with our own happiness. You're going to see how a lot of these play on each other, because we will get obsessed with our own happiness. This will produce a level of dysfunction in your life because you were never created to be at the center of your own world. So when you put yourself at the center of your own world, the only thing that can come from that is dysfunction. 
because you were never created to function that way. You were never created for it to be about you. Number two, entitlement. You put yourself at the center. You forget the grandeur and the glory of God. You become an entitled person. You begin thinking in terms of what you deserve, what you have the right to, and you'll begin judging the love of God and the love of others based on how well they make that happen. Just think about that. When you get entitled and you start thinking about this is what I deserve, when, when the phrase this is not fair starts rolling out of your mouth all the time, you become an entitled person. Okay, and I'm not talking about real justice. That's a real thing. I'm not talking about justice. But I'm talking about you daily thinking I deserve this and I have the right to this. Then what you do is you look at God and you say, God, you're here for my bidding. My family's here for my bidding. And you begin to question their love for you because they're not willing to necessarily deliver on what you think they should be delivering on. Number three, discontent. If it's all about you, if it is all about you, you will never be a content person. Why? Because you that's not the way that God has made us to function. The people in your life aren't in your life for the sole purpose of making you content and happy. And you say that again. The people in your life are not in your life for the sole purpose of making you content and happy. The world was not designed for your bidding. It won't operate according to your personal plan. And it will never be as you want it to be. So think about it. If it's never going to be that way, then this is a futile endeavor that you're undertaking. Because no matter what, the world is not going to do your bidding. So if you live in all of yourself and you put yourself at the center, the only thing that can happen is you become discontent. Because this world is not going to function for you the way that you want it to. Lasting contentment comes, though, when you live for something bigger than yourself. When you live for something larger than yourself. That's where real contentment comes from. Number four. Relational dysfunction. When we're at the center and not God, we're going to see people one of two ways. Listen very carefully to this. When we are at the center and not God, when we forget that God's supposed to be at the center, then we are going to see people one of two ways. We're either going to see people as a means of me getting what I want or being in the way of getting what I want. So all the relationships in my life, I am going to view them, you're either in my way, remember, I'm making this all about me. So either you make this all about me or you're in my way. Or you're going to, you're going to use people in your life to try to make it all about you. And so all of your personal relationships are kind of going to become dysfunctional. Because that's not how relationships are supposed to work. I, I, I use this term, and I mean it, when we do this, we dehumanize people. <laughs> people simply become a means to my glory. I don't see them as human beings made in the image of God to be honored and respected. I see them as things that I can use to make it about me or that I need to, to stomp on so that I can keep making it about myself because they're in the way. We can begin looking at relationships for identity, wanting everyone else to make us feel good, but this is not how relationships have been designed to be. And so this is going to lead to relational chaos. Only when our all is in the right place can our relationships be as they should be. Do you know how many times I have sat with teenagers, college students, young adults, and said to them, if you want your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or your relationship with your fiancé, or your relationship with your husband or wife, if you want them to be as they should be, 
then both of you have to make Jesus the center of your life. If you don't, forget about your relationship being the way you want it to be. It will never happen. And that is why we look at the world around us and we see relational chaos everywhere. Because if you got two people and they're both making it about themselves, what chance do you have? A relationship cannot work unless we've got our all in the right place. Such a pivotal thing for people to understand and realize. Number five, control. One of the most glorious, tru glorious truths in all the Bible is that God is sovereign. In charge of everything. What peace that brings. Knowing God is in charge of everything. But when we get vertical amnesia, and God is not the center, we forget the grandeur and glory of God. This is going to rob us of us being able to rest in that truth. And we are going to try to take control of everything. You will try to exert your will over people and places and things, and you'll be threatened by anyone who tries to take control away from you. And as I've said in here before, control, it is a myth. You don't have any. We act like we do. But that is just a, a way of us being at the center of everything and trying to make it about us. You do not have control. However, when we are in awe of God and we're trusting in His sovereignty, there is a rest that we can have. When things don't go exactly as we want them to go and things, things that we plan don't go exactly like we want them planned, there is a rest we can still have in that. Number six, fear. <laughs> I think we are motivated by fear, worry, and dread much more than we realize. Again, I'm not talking about clinical anxiety here. I'm talking about the daily fears and worries and dread that consume much of our lives. Many of our decisions that we make in our lives, we base them on trying to avoid things that we're afraid of. Rather than having the courage to stand in the face of those things and deal with them. We want to be afraid. We want to run from those things. You know the only thing that has the power to defeat fear is fear. The only thing that can beat the fear of the daily things in our lives is fear of Yahweh. When we are in all of God, when we are, we have proper fear of God in our lives then our heart will be free from the little fears that come against us on a daily basis. Because we know that God's got it. So when we have the big fear of God as we should, then the little fears of life aren't near as powerful. Number seven, anger. In my 17 years of doing ministry, 17 and a half now, of doing ministry, I have seen self-centered people become very angry people. You ever notice someone, when it's all about them, those people become very angry people. And you know what usually where it starts? It starts with an anger, uh, an anger that they have toward God. Do you know that most atheists, do you know why most people call themselves atheists that are atheists? Because somewhere along the line, God didn't do for them what they wanted God to do for them. I can give you about three stories that I've experienced in my own personal life of friends who have become atheists. And I know exactly when they became an atheist. It's when everything that they thought they had planned fell through. And so there must not be a God because God isn't doing for me what I wanted God to do for me. Well, that just took, showed me where, where you were in your walk with God to begin with. It was all about you. So people get angry with God because God didn't do for them what they wanted. God to do for them. That's why, I'm, uh, number one, there aren't atheists, right? 
man's without excuse. They know God. But most people, um, they're not atheists. They're anti-theists. They're just against God. They're mad at God. C.S. Lewis said he, he saw the, uh, the hypocrisy in atheism because he was mad at God for not existing. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I'm mad at God for not existing. What? That doesn't make any sense. How can you be mad at someone that doesn't exist for not existing? And he realized how ridiculous it was. They express their anger then at others who cannot fix for them what God failed. So God failed me and now other people aren't coming through for me too. So I'm going to now express that anger at the people in my life who aren't helping me be what I want to be. Number eight, envy. What causes envy? It's not really a need problem. It's not an equality problem. It's surely not a partiality of God problem. Envy is an all problem. When I am in awe of God's greatness, I am able to be grateful in my life. When I am in awe of God's greatness, I am able to be grateful in my life. But if not, we become scorekeepers, don't we? Comparing ourselves with our neighbors, comparing ourselves with other people, when you do that, you're going to struggle to be satisfied. Because you can always find somebody else who has it better than you. So if you're a scorekeeper in life, you can always find somebody else who's got, got it better than you do, and there, you're going to be envious of them. However, when we focus on God and His greatness, we're able to live gratefully. Number nine, drivenness. All of God and rest are connected with one another. All of God and rest are connected with one another. When I am in awe of God, I can rest. I can be at peace. I'm not going to have this envy and this, this anger and this discontentment. And I'm not going to have all that going on inside of me when I am in awe of God. Of God. However, when we put ourselves at the center, we begin to feel like we're holding our entire lives on our own shoulders. My life having any meaning has it's up to me. I've got to, I if I'm gonna have any kind of fruit and success in my life, I'm the one who's gotta who's gotta do it. I'm in charge of, of the results of my life. Instead of just simply doing what I'm supposed to do and leaving the success up to God or the fruit up to God. I become driven to take that weight upon myself. Perhaps drivenness is sometimes more about self-glory than we tend to think. So we feel like we have to work more, try harder, because my glory is up to me. And guess what that's going to lead to? Number 10, exhaustion. When, when, you, when your success and your kingdom and your glory is the only thing you're thinking about, and so you're driven as hard as you can to find that and to experience that, you will end up exhausted. Because it's a never-ending striving. When can you ever stop and be like, okay, I've made it? Never. Never. There's no peace in that. But when, when we're not dealing with blindness and forgetfulness and God is at the center and we're focused on His grandeur and His glory and His greatness, again, there's this sense in which God's got this. This is not about me. This is not about my glory. Have you ever met and... I don't run in all the same circles that, you know, like other pastor circles. But I've met pastors who their ministry is all about their own glory. And they do everything they do to make it about them. And so they are driven beyond exhaustion. Because they think this is all going to rise and fall on me. Instead of saying, I'm going to be obedient to God. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love the people that God has given me. 
and I'm just going to be content serving God's people. That's why um, so so often in, in ministry you have pastors that are simply using churches as stepping stones to the next thing, right? Yeah. I had a, I had a pastor ask me once, um, probably about ten years ago, "What's your ministry plans?" I was like, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "Well, when when are you gonna, you know, be a pastor of a church?" And I said, "Well, I, I am pastoring a church." Yeah, but yeah, I'm like, you know what he was saying? What? When are you gonna? Use Calvary Hill as a stepping stone to something bigger. That's what he was thinking. And I was just like, I'm doing what I want to do. I to teach and preach all the time. I to love on people. to minister to people. I'm, I'm fine. But when you, when you make it about self-glory, you're, you're never fine. You're never fine. So you're going to get exhausted because... You use one thing as a stepping stone, but, oh, there's another stepping stone. And you know what? I wrote this book. I'm just thinking like a pastor, right? I wrote this book, and I sold 500,000 copies. But John Piper writes a book, and he sells $2 million. Okay, I, now i got to dream. i got to write a better book next time. You see the game? You see the game that happens? And that's an example of how pastors do it, but lay people in the pews do the same thing all the time. And that kind of drivenness leads to exhaustion. Number 11, Doubt. All amnesia is a principal producer of doubt. The more you lose sight of the centrality of God, the more you're going to focus on yourself. The more you focus on yourself, the more you're going to focus on your own wants, your own dreams, your own hopes, your own goals. The more that you focus on those things, the more that you're going to see the love of God as a willingness or a lack of willingness to deliver those things to me. And if God does not deliver to me what I want, then I will doubt His goodness. If God does not give me, I'm making it all about me, so it's all about my hopes and my dreams, and so God, if you love me and if you're good, you'll give me that. And when God doesn't, we doubt Him and His goodness and His greatness. Number 12, spiritual coldness. When we forget the grandeur and glory of God, we will not find Him worth worshiping. When we forget the grandeur and glory of God, we will not find Him. We will find Him not worth worshiping. The best way for you to make it not about you is to think about how great he is and how huge he is and how wonderful he is. <clears throat> C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking of, uh, less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. When we stop thinking about ourselves all the time and we're thinking about him, we'll see how huge he is and he'll be, we will know he's worth worshiping. Last thing, spiritual atrophy. We all know what atrophy is, right? It's a, a wasting away, a decline of effectiveness due to lack of use. If someone's in a coma for a year, they are, their legs and their, um, their body is going to have atrophy. And they're going to have to go through a lot of rehab um, in order to help with that. Pam France was just um, in a situation like that for a week, and she's got to go to physical therapy. So um, atrophy sets in very quickly, and our... Muscles get weak because we don't use them effectively, and so um, the capacity shrinks. Well, this can happen spiritually as well. When we forget the greatness of God, instead of your life continuing to expand and your life continuing to get greater and, and closer to the grandeur and glory of God, it begin to shrink to the size of your personal hopes and dreams, or it will begin to shrink to the size of what the world has to offer. Anytime I think about this, I think of the Grinch. <laughs> Right? What happened? Because the Grinch made it all about him. What happened? His heart just began to shrink and shrivel up. And, right? There's a beautiful principle in that. When we make it all about us, then what happens is, is that spiritual atrophy sets in and everything becomes weak and everything begins because we're not using what, we're, what we've been given for the proper purposes. So we eat little of the true satisfying food that God has to give 
We try to feed ourselves on temporary things that cannot give us true nutrition. That is the beautiful illustration that Jesus uses in John chapter 6. I am the true bread from heaven. He says, I am the bread of life. Eat my, eat my bread, eat my flesh, drink my blood. You'll be satisfied. What does, what does he mean by that? What he means is if you go to anything less to find nourishment, spiritual nourishment, you're never gonna, it's never going to quench that hunger and that thirst. So, the world is this way by nature. What they need is regeneration. Repentance and faith coming to Christ. Believers, what we've got to do is we have to daily, daily acknowledge, Lord, in my flesh, today, I will make this all about me. Lord, in my flesh, I am broken. Lord, in my flesh, I am fallen. And what I want to do every single day is I want to go to the great physician and say, Lord, I need, I need you to move within me to make it about you today. Daily go to the Lord and say, Lord, today, help me to see and remember the wonder of your greatness. But I don't think Christians, I don't think we do this very often. I don't think we wake up in the morning and think, Lord, today, today, help me to really see your glory and greatness in everything. Help me to be in awe of you today in everything. When we confess our problem, as Christians, when we confess our problem. You know what that pushes us to? The arms of grace. So let's confess that we struggle with this. And that many of the issues that we have, a spiritual coldness, doubt of God, exhaustion, drivenness, envy, anger, fear, control, relational dysfunction, discontentment, entitlement, self-centeredness, it comes because we are not in awe of God like we should be. We forget. We don't see problems. Let's admit that this is a problem. And when we admit that this is a problem, then we'll be thrown into the arms of grace. And we'll see his glory and grandeur as we